Uh, we've been going through a, a series of messages that God gave me, obviously, specifically for this Sunday. And uh, we're on the third Sunday of Advent. And we've been talking about a number of things that God is doing for us. But think for just a minute with me. If you were a doctor and you were asked to assess what's wrong with this world, why is it the way it is? How many of you think there's something wrong with this world? Okay. If you were to assess what's wrong with this world, what would you assess? What's that? It is Christ-less. Go ahead. Steal my whole sermon. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Uh, that just means you've gotten all the other ones up till now. That's what that means. Uh, it is Christless. And what she means by that literally is we're just pushing Christ away at every chance we get. Uh, whether it's the classroom or, or the judgment halls of our courts or uh, wherever, we're just pushing Christ. We're like a little spoiled brat about to be spanked, and we're just pushing and shoving and kicking and we're saying, I don't want God. I don't want God. God's not the answer. Don't make me take God. We won't make you take God. Promise. But if you don't take him, you'll come to a place where you wish you had. And that's the message that we give to this world, that what is Christmas about? Well, it's all about Christ. And Christ is the true now, let me get that up there. Christ Jesus is indeed the true reason for the season. All the rest is fine. All the traditions, I don't mind them at all. Enjoy them. Watch, you know, as, as my grandkids open the presents, uh, some of which they've already been given. <laughs> uh, you know, those are wonderful. But they all speak to the Christ who is the greatest gift who was ever given. Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, one, the, the Christ, the word Christ is Christos. It speaks of the anointed one of God. Bless you. Uh, and then uh, Jesus is the human name. Uh, it's, that's the Greek form of the word Joshua, or Yeshua, or God delivers in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament. So Christ Jesus, either name is appropriate. One speaks of his deity, one speaks of his humanity. Put them together, you've got uh, the, the, the hypostatic union of the dual nature of Christ. You've got the fact he was God and man, 100%. He's the reason for the season. Why do we have Christmas? Why do we have crushes or cradles? For the simple realization that everything that's wrong with this world can be solved at some level or another by receiving Christ and taking his reality and his truth and putting it in the middle of that situation. Well, I'm going to explain that statement as we go along. But uh, what's wrong with the world? And if you were the doctor, at what point would you come to? wouldn't take me long to come to Jeremiah 17.9. The human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. How did we get to needing the Christ child back when he came in the middle of the Roman uh, reign? The heart was deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. When we look at it now, it's only gotten worse. The human heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And then that verse ends by saying, who will acknowledge that? We sit in church pews and we say, well, that's the problem. See, we're Christless in this world. Uh, but until the world comes to the point where it says, we recognize that we need Christ and our hearts are both deceitful and desperately wicked, until the world comes to that point, the world is not going to change. It's not going to change. And so Christmas is the celebration of the fact that God said, for everything that's wrong with you, I give you Jesus. I give you Jesus. First week, we looked at the fact that, uh, that being Christ, being 
the Christ of Christmas. Who is the Christ of Christmas? He's the God of all hope. What's missing from this world? You turn on the news and I don't hear a lot of hope. You know, it's, boy, this is, this is going crazy and then that's going downhill and, and uh, the Middle East is falling apart and, and hey, there might be attacks here in the U.S. and we hear all of these crazy things. And then you just want to turn the TV off and say, wait a minute. You're trying to tell me there's no hope. And my hope is in Jesus. He hasn't died. He hasn't gone anywhere. I mean, since his resurrection. And our hope is in him. That was the first week. He is the God of all hope. What does this world need? It needs hope and it needs help. And that comes from Christ. The second week we looked at... Uh, the, who is this Christ of Christmas? He is the God of all. And what did I say to you last week? Tell your face you have the joy of the Lord. Tell your face you have the joy of the Lord. We don't know how every one of the situations that we prayed for this morning and, and other situations as well will turn out. But does that mean we're hopeless? Bill, I want to tell you, God has your answers. And whether it's here or in the life to come, you've got the Lord. You've got the Lord. Nothing else matters, folks. There may be suffering in between. There may be physical illness in between. There may be times that we don't want to go through. There may be doctor's appointments and hospital appointments. But don't ever let them be times where you don't know what to do and you're hopeless because they are times when the God of all hope is with us and in the midst of that He gives to us joy. Joy in the midst of hope. That's the big surprise that I've experienced Uh, in the last three weeks is the joy in the midst of everything else that's going on. Wow. I didn't expect that. Joy for Cheryl. She's at home with the Lord. I know her. She's doing cartwheels with little kids all over the clouds of heaven. Uh, Joy. This week, we'll deal with the fact that He is the God of all, say it with me, peace. Peace. Peace is the absence of anxiety. Anxiety goes when you understand that God is in charge of your peace. Does that make sense? He's in charge of our peace. And He gets to take away everything else that doesn't fit in the puzzle. And that's where we'll be at this week with that message. Last week, next week, will be He is the God of all love. Wow. Love. They even write secular songs about this. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the one thing there's just too little of. Remember that song? Stretching back a ways. Some of the younger ones are going, what? Yeah, that's a song. That is what the world needs now is love. And we're going to get to that, Lord willing, next week. Uh, but uh, this week, actually, we're on. This was the major focus of the first week, which was put your hope in the Christ of Christmas. Romans 13, 15, 13. God, who is what? The source of all hope, will fill you completely with, this is where I got the next two weeks, joy and peace. It's all together in that passage. The God of hope will bring you joy and will bring you peace. Wow. Peace. Why? Here's, here's the, you know, let me, let me look behind the curtain. So how do we get this peace? You're talking about peace. It's right there, folks. We trust in Him. Where does peace come from? We trust in Him. From a sometime, I should say most of the time now, recovering, perfectionistic, uh, you know, overachieving, workaholic. That's called a POW. 
case you didn't figure that out. Uh, as long as you and I try and figure out, how am I going to make this happen? How do I keep all the balls in the air? What do I do with this? And what about our finances? And what, what's, You're going to go crazy. That's the garden for anxiety. Hello. Only when we come to the place, and that's why I say I'm a recovering, because I know the focus. I know the answer. The answer is very simple. Turn it over to Jesus, who's the reason for the season, not just on December 25th, but every single day of the year. Every day of the year, we take our stress, we take our sorrows, we take our fears. Every day of the year, we take our anxieties and we lay them at the foot of the cross. And we say, God, I can't handle this. No matter how many balls go in the air and no matter how many you take away, I still can't balance them all. I still can't do it all. Major secret here, you were never meant to. Oh, and I tried for so hard and for so many years. Keep those balls all up there. Good father, good pastor, good this. And I drop a ball and I go, oh, it's shameful. None of us were meant to hold all those balls in the air, folks. Only God can do that. And when being human, you blow it, God says, my child, I love you. That's okay. Are you doing better now than you did a year ago or six years ago or whatever? If you're not, then you're not trusting in the Lord. Then you're not resting in Him. I'm seeing some heads going, that's right, okay. So God, the source of all hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace. Why? Because you trust in Him. I have this strange position I find myself in at times as a counselor where I put on the techniques and the, uh, the things that I understand and, and know as a counselor, and yet, in reality, only Jesus can make it better. All the theories and all the possibilities and all the medication can't do what Jesus can do with one touch, one word. And so, we do our best to help where we can, but folks understand that Jesus is the answer. Wherever we're at in life. And he finishes that up by simply saying, Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, who resides with inside of you. So, second week, let your joy. This was our focus for that week. We ended with this. Let your joy be in the Christ of Christmas. Luke 24, 52. Remember that? That was the... Two disciples on the road to Emmaus. It's Easter Sunday evening, three days before Christ was brutally crucified. And they took him down and they laid him in a tomb and all of the disciples' hopes for salvation were dashed. And here are these two disciples there walking on the road from Jerusalem to uh, Emmaus and they're talking about how bad it is. How awful. And this guy steps up with them and starts to walk with them. And he says to them, well, tell me, what is it you're so upset about? Well, are you the only one in Jerusalem that doesn't know that the one we thought who was Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, that they crucified Him on Friday? And He lays in a grave and our hopes are dashed. Don't you know? I think God says the same thing to us today. Don't you know? That had to be so that I could bring victory to your life. Had to be. And their life was standing in between them. Strong and tall and healthy. And they never understood and they didn't get it even though he began expounding to them the scriptures from the Old Testament, it says. And he unveiled to them who Yeshua was, who the Messiah was. And they're kind of going, wow, well, it makes sense to me. But Jesus is in the tomb. Well, it makes sense to me. But Jesus, 
Every time you say, but my circumstances say this, you look at your circumstances and you say, but Jesus is out of the tomb and lives in me and is here to make a difference in my life today and to help me make a difference in the world around me. And so now they make it to Emmaus, they sit down at the table, and they take a loaf of bread because they've been walking for a couple of hours. It's about 15 miles from Jerusalem to, to uh, Emmaus. And they've walked in, they've sat down. They're... He takes the bread and he tears the bread like he did just a few days before as we celebrated communion this morning. And as he broke the bread, they noticed that the prints of the nails were still in his hands. And can you just imagine the eyes when they looked at him and realized it's Yeshua. It's Yeshua. Now, I don't know. I, I, I know this. The Scripture says that we shall be like Christ in heaven, for we shall see him as he is. Uh, I don't know why the two disciples on the road to Emmaus didn't understand that that was Jesus, but it didn't take them long after they saw the prince in the nails of his hands on that bread to know that he had broken his own body. He, not Roman soldiers, he had his own body broken that he might bring to us eternal life and joy and peace and hope and healing. That's why he came. That's why he came. And so now, this verse is just very simply, Jesus has shown them his hands. He disappears from the table in the midst. Absolutely disappears. He's gone. They look at each other and they say, didn't our hearts burn within us as he was talking about uh, you know, what Yeshua would do and what the Old Testament promised and, and how Jesus fulfilled Every one of those promises, didn't our hearts burn within us? It was Him. He stood behind, beside us. He walked with us. He broke bread with us. Remember how He said, I won't break bread again until it's in the kingdom? That was the beginning of the kingdom. Easter Sunday evening, there it was. And He broke the bread with them. Imagine. So what did they do? Well, it's now dark. It's now nighttime. And they're now in Emmaus at their destination. And they say, can't do this. It's like Mary and Martha at the garden. they got to go up and run. I don't think it took them the same time to get back to Jerusalem as it took them to get to Jerusalem. I think they took off on a tear. And it says while they're running that they worshipped Him. Jesus was here. I touched Him. I took bread from Him. He was real. He was alive. Jesus. And they worshipped Him. Now watch this, because this is for you and me. And they returned to Jerusalem. What was Jerusalem? Their everyday life. The best way to return to your everyday life is with worship and praise. I didn't get a single amen, but I still believe it. The best way to return to your everyday life, the life filled with pain, with hurt, with anxiety, with fear, the best way to go back to Jerusalem is to do it with praise and with worship. There isn't a better way. Why? Because what you're doing is you are recognizing Yeshua. You're applying the medicine of Christ's being to your mess. And there's nothing better. The only other way to go back to the life, your everyday life, is to do it with frustration, sorrow, hopelessness. Or apply the principles of salvation to your life. Jesus did this for me. He just didn't do it for the world. He did it for you and for me. And that's what that meant. They worshipped and then they returned to Jerusalem, their everyday life. And they did it with great what? Joy, 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 joy. 
I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? <laughs> down in my heart. Okay. Now this one. Gather your peace. We've looked at hope. We've looked at joy. What is the one thing America? I mean, we're calling for peace accords in the Middle East. That's a joke. Until you bring Jesus into that factor, there'll be no peace. You cannot have peace in your heart until you recognize that Jesus lives there. And I think probably, I'm not talking about Portland Congregational Church, I'm talking worldwide. Much of the church has failed to recognize that I need to apply who Jesus is to my life. I'm born again. I accept that Jesus saved me. He's my fire escape from hell. But I don't know how to apply. I haven't yet applied who Christ is to everything that's going on in my life. You do it as simply as you did salvation. You just say, God, my heart's a mess. My mind is a mess. My spirit's a mess. I love that song. In the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus. In the evening, give me Jesus. When I come to that point when I'm going to die, give me Jesus. Whatever part of life you're in, the only answer is give me Jesus. That's it. And so Romans 1, 5, uh, 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by all my good works and trying hard as I can to put everything together to make everything go exactly as I think it ought to go, no? Hey, I tried hard. I want you to know I spent a lot of years trying to be justified by my own good works. Are you telling me that was wrong? We want, and some of us more than others, we want so much to have all of our ducks in a row lined up, to have everything together, all of our balls in the air, Somehow we think we're going to be loved and accepted if we do that. You know what? You do that, and there'll still be people who think you're unworthy of love. Even if you could put all your ducks in a row and balance all of your balls and do everything else we're talking about, even if you could do that, this emptiness in your heart would not go away. God isn't looking for perfection at least not the kind of perfection we think he's looking for. Right, John? We talked about that earlier. He's looking for his perfection, but not ours. It's not that we're justified by doing everything that I should do as a good Christian man, good Christian woman. I try my hardest, and I wouldn't tell a soul that I'm now in defeat because I blew it 16 times before I even got started. You know? Welcome to the club. Let me shake your hand. We have all sinned. We have all come short of the glory of God. Every one of us. Romans says, Isaiah says, we've all gone astray. And the Lord hath laid on Him, Christ Jesus, the iniquity, the failures, the miserableness of us all. That's what Christmas morning is about. Sending us a Messiah who would show us how to live and then show us how to die. And then how to walk into eternity. That's it. Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified, not by works, but by faith in Christ's works, we have what? Peace. Peace. news for you. Even if the world's a mess, you can walk in peace. Well, how do I do that? You do it through Christ. There is no other way. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That vacuum that you feel inside of you that you can never please people really probably is a longing that says you're trying to please God and you don't feel like you can do it. None of us can. Your pastor can't. How do we please God? 
by saying, Lord, I rest in you. I trust in you. I can't trust in me. I can't, I'm not trustworthy. I'm not trustworthy. Some of you look at me like, Pastor, no, I don't want to hear you're not trustworthy. I know my humanness. I'm not tr- Is that an excuse to go do something? Not on your life. Not on your life. <laughs> or should I say, not in your lifetime or mine. I'm not about to go do anything, but I do know this, that alone by myself, in my flesh, I am not trustworthy. I just know that. Well, see, how do you know that? We have all these wonderful thoughts about you. I hope you do. But just remember, I've lived with me for 67 years, and I know. I know these things. Wow. We have peace with the God who created us. Why do we have peace? Because it comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. We keep hearing this. It comes through Christ. It comes through Christ. That's the theme of Christmas. That's what we're trying to get through. This world is a mess. There is no hope. There is no joy. There is no peace. Where do we go to get that? Jesus. Are you, I'm not looking for a show of hands, are you in His Word? Are you reading His Word? Are you spending time alone with Him? And when you're alone with Him, do you understand He loves you? Sometimes we're afraid to go to him because we figure that by the time we get there, he'll be beat up on us because we know all the places we failed. You don't want to hear this. He knows the places where you haven't yet failed and you're going to fail. And he still loves you. And he still loves you. Do you think he knew that Peter was going to use profanity on a 15-year-old or 14-year-old girl the night in which Jesus was betrayed? Do you think Jesus knew that Peter was going to three times deny Christ? He said he did. He warned Peter. And yet on the morning of his resurrection, where did Jesus go for breakfast? He went to Peter. He went to Peter, and Peter's out there because Peter said, I go a fishing. I'm going back to my everyday job. I'm going to go do what I know to do because I'm confused about this Messiah stuff and everything else, and I don't get it, and it doesn't make sense to me, and I'm done with it. I'm just walking away. You ever tried that? You may walk away from God, but he's not going to let you walk away from him. He's got you in a loving, loving way. And he shows up, and and there's Peter out in the boat, and he's trying to catch fish. You know what? Once you served as a fisher of men, you're ruined for fishing for fish. (laughs) Fishing for fish, you get a good one, a nice one, whether it's a, uh, you know, it's a walleye. My dad used to fish for walleye out in Chautauqua. I've got this wonderful picture of my dad standing there holding a couple of walleyes. Uh, And they were big. They were about this big, and their tails touched the ground. And he had such joy that day. You know what? You go fishing for the souls of men and you bring back eternal souls and you say to yourself, wow, ain't nothing like it. Fishing is fun, but wow. Fishing for the souls of men, that's eternal. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. A couple, two, I found two dictionary definitions that seem to be opposing, but one is external and the other one is internal. Uh, It says, peace is defined as a confirmed agreement bringing an end to the hostilities and war between two parties. That's peace. Think about the Camp David Accord. Do you remember the Camp David Accord? It was really quite a big deal. Uh, And it brought peace in the Middle East for at least for a while. Uh, And we talk about, and the commentators talked about, the peace that it brought for a short time. Uh, Listen to this. We need to understand and accept and acknowledge what the Word says. The Word says in Romans 5.10, For we were the enemies of God. Not because He declared us to be enemies, but because we declared ourselves to be enemies against God. 
God said, I love you. We said, I don't care. God said, I want you to do this for me. And we said, I'm not doing that. I want you to read my word. I'm not reading your word. There was an uh, there was this spirit of just being an enemy with God. Whatever God was for, we were again. We were enemies. You know, you know how you got that way? You were born that way. That's what the book of Revel or the book of Romans says very clearly. That we were born with a dead spirit. Thank you, Adam and Eve. Came right down through the bloodline. We were born with a defiant spirit towards God. And only receiving Christ will change that defiance. And so if we're going to have peace between us and God, guess who's got to affect it? God. Because we don't have what it takes to put it all together. We don't have what it takes. And so Romans 5.10 says, We were the enemies of God, but he, he, he reconciled us. Any of you ever deal with books, banking? You know what it means when it says you've got to reconcile the account. You, you do. Roy does. I remember Roy sitting for Sunday afternoon. I'd say, Roy, go home. We'd take the offering. He'd try and find a missing 10 cents, couldn't find it. He would stay there till 4 in the afternoon until he found that 10 cents because he was going to make sure that the books reconciled. That means that everything on this side equals this side. Nothing hidden, nothing lost. Nothing lied about. It's all right there. You know what I'm talking about. Folks, God uses a legal financial term to say to you, I have straightened out the books between you and me. There is nothing for you to fear. Well, how can that be? I still have remembrances of all of these things. And the Father says, because I gave you my son and he paid all your debts. You don't have a debt anymore. You're now a child of the king, an heir to the throne, and you have the DNA of God within you. I'm just telling you what God tells you. Second point under this, the definitions. The first was an external. It's war, person against person, company against company, country against country. And it's got to be reconciled before peace happens. And then the second one is internal. Peace internally. A strong sense of serenity. Letting go. Those who've ever attended a a, a 12-step program know the prayer of serenity. Uh, There were two German brothers, Richard and Reinhold Niebuhr, and they were German theologians, and one of them, I think it was, I don't remember which one it was, wrote the prayer to serenity. And for years we've had it out back there. I don't know if there's copies of it still there. probably needs to be. Needs to remind us That serenity, or I would say the lack of it, the lack of peace, the lack of serenity, comes from not allowing Christ to fill your heart. Take out all the junk. Cheryl taught me as a farmer, you got to take out the weeds before you can plant the seeds. We want all the weeds to stay inside, all the hatred, all the anger, all the bitterness, all the anxiety, all the fears. Leave them in there and try and plant something good and then wonder why it gets choked out. Allow God to empty the garden of your mind. Allow Him to take the weeds of fear and doubt and anxiety and anger and bitterness. Let Him take those weeds out. And then let him plant his love and his peace. A strong sense of serenity that's internal. An undisturbed state of mind. I love it when you folks regularly, and you do, and I love you for it, come up to me and say, Pastor, Pastor, how you doing? I understand what you're asking me. And you understand what you're, you're asking me. Are you falling apart yet? You know? Is you all right? You going to make it? 
Now, let me tell you, I'm going to make it. Definitely going to make it. Why? Because of the peace of Christ within. It's internal. And it literally is an undisturbed state of mind. Do I not cry? Usually when you're not around. Because I fear that will upset you or unsettle you in your faith. Uh, oh, do I miss Cheryl. I Talking with June this morning. I ain't even begun to begun to miss her yet. You know, it's only been, I don't know, 20, 30 days. But I have peace. The tears aren't for her, praise God. You know, the tears are the ache because I miss her. She was such a, a, a great part. I know that many of you who uh, have loved ones who've gone home to be with the Lord to feel the same way. An undisturbed state of mind. A sense of calm. A sense of quiet. And inner tranquility. And inner tranquility. The one thing that's gotten to me through all of this is, is that I've got tons of people who are hanging around and loving on me, family and, and church and whatever. And at some point, I just want to say lovingly, please, go away. I need to be alone with my thoughts. I told my family, New Year's Day, I need to be alone with my thoughts. Can I just have New Year's Day? Uh, so I just put my head together, you know. And what will I do during that time of putting my head together? Pray. Thank God for what was, but commit myself to that whatever He is bringing for the future, I'm open to. I'm not still mad about what happened. Uh, I never was mad. I was glad for Cheryl. Uh, and so a strong sense of serenity, undisturbed state of mind, calm, quiet, and an inner tranquility. Well, where does that come from? Acts chapter 10 and verse 36. And the Word... now. What was one of the many names of Christ? The living Word. The Word, this passage says, which God the Father sent was, what was the Word that He sent? Preaching peace. I didn't say that. That's what the Word says. The literal uh, written Word says that the Word or the message of that Word was that He was preaching peace. Peace between God and peace between me. So number one, that external where I feel like, oh God, I'm such a mess. How can you look at me? And God says, I love you. You get that? I love you. Never mind what's going on in the inside. I love you just the way you're, you're at, wherever you're at. And the word which he sent was preaching peace. And where did that peace come from? By Jesus Christ. He doesn't offer you a pill. He doesn't offer you uh, a procedure. He doesn't offer you a person. The thing that used to drive me crazy when I uh, was in Buffalo and I ran scores of premarital weekends, premarital preparation weekends, uh, was that I'd say to couples, you need to understand, you don't need the person sitting beside you for you to be happy. In fact, the reality is, if you're not happy, they can't make you happy. What you need is Jesus, and then when you're together in Christ, then go find that other person and build a relationship with them through Christ. You try telling that to 30 couples who are goo-goo-eyed on each other. They're just, oh, he's wonderful. He's wonderful. Oh, she's beautiful, you know. And the reality of it was very simple. What they thought they needed was each other, and what I knew they needed was Jesus. I've had a number of them come back and say, you know, it took me six, seven, eight years to learn what you were telling me, but we've come to Christ and we're serving Him together. Praise God. <laughs> okay. Come on. Why isn't this... Uh, it's blinking, Tom. Does that just mean? Yeah, you can forward it. I've only got a couple more there. That's fine. Thank you very much. He should get triple his pay today. To which he giggled. Yeah. 
gather your peace. Acts 10, 36. This is the message of the good news. What is that scene called? It's the message of the good news. What's the good news? The good news is that there is peace. Everybody say peace. There is peace. Yes, with God, but if there's peace with God, you can get peace with you. You need that. We all need that. This is the message of the good news. There is peace with God through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 5, 14. Peace be with all of you who love the Lord Jesus Christ, who are in Christ Jesus. Peace be with you. You say, well, Pastor, I understand you've lived the, 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 the Christian life your whole life, and that's why you've got this peace, and, and that's good, that's okay, but I'm not you. If you are in Christ, then you have the peace of Christ. It's not about theological degrees. It's not about ministry. It's not about anything except Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have peace. Now, whether or not you accept that peace is up to you, but you have peace. The last one here is Colossians 3.15. Oh, this really, I probably should have spent the whole message on this verse. Let the peace of Christ. Where does the responsibility in that sentence fall? God says, I have given you the peace of Christ. I died to give you the peace of Christ. Now it's up to you to let it rule in your heart. When fear comes up and rears its ugly face and, and says, it's going to be this way and this way and it's going to be so bad, you say, wrong. Because I have the peace of Christ. I have the peace of Christ. And I will only let Christ's peace rule in this heart. Those are strong words. You let the peace of Christ rule, dominate in your heart. Who gets to decide that? You do. Minner, Doctors Minnerith and Meyer wrote a marvelous book, and it's, it's simply called Happiness is a Choice. And they're both Christian psychiatrists, brilliant scholars of the Word as well as psychiatrists. And, and basically what they say in their book is, you know what, happiness is up to you. If you give your life to Christ and then allow Him to rule His peace in your life, you'll have a lifetime of happiness. It's up to you. Does that mean everything will go right? Life will be a bowl full of cherries? Of course not. We've all got struggles, but it does mean even through the struggles. Tom, I don't know if I can get up one more or not. Oh, yeah, okay. Philippians 4, my favorite uh, chapter of the Bible. I memorized this for, for uh, Bible quizzing probably at about the age of 13, that whole chapter. God, God's peace exceeds anything we can understand. What are you going through that you just can't understand? doesn't matter. Christ's peace will exceed it. His peace will guard, and the Greek word there literally means he sends angels to stand around about your mind and protect your mind. Do you understand that he's sending angels to protect your mind? Go back to the last one that says, let it be so. Surrender to the angels. There's a word you will hear every single Sunday before this service begins if you join us in prayer. And it either comes out of my mouth or Barb's or both. We surrender. It's your church, God. It's your service, God. We surrender. Do what you want to do. And when we do that, the angels come and begin to guard and move and, and take the situation the way it should go. His peace will guard your hearts. That's your emotions. That's your emotions. And your minds, your reasoning powers. Sometimes your emotions get out of whack. Sometimes your reasoning powers. You overthink the problem. Ever overthought a problem? I've overthought lots of problems. It says God's peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in the acknowledgement that God is there. I think there's one more and that's it. Mm. So how long do we have to settle for this lack of peace? 
on the earth, the external. Not long, because this is what God says. Not just the peace of God, but the God of peace. The God who institutes peace shall bruise, bruise, do him in. (laughs) Satan under his feet doesn't say that. It says under your feet. What are you going through? Don't raise your hand and tell me. Uh, You know, what's troubling you? Surrender it to God and let Him bruise Satan under your foot as you surrender those issues to Him and say, I choose to live in peace. Is life perfect? No. I don't know any life that's perfect. Even Jesus, who was perfect, His life wasn't perfect. And I don't mean His actions. I mean the circumstances that He got involved in were were not always easy for Him to deal with. Life's not perfect, but Jesus is there in the middle of it. And the God of peace will bruise, shall bruise under your feet, Satan, shortly. That's a global thing, folks. We've talked about what you can do personally, and now we're at the end. And the end is there's coming a day when God, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, returns to earth. And when he does, that begins a whole prophetic timeline of events that literally will take this world away from Satan and give it back to God. When's that going to happen? Shortly. Who said that? The Apostle Paul. 